Merry Christmas and happy holidays. I'm your host, Abby Sampson. Thank you so much for joining me today in the Sampson Historical Study. I'm sure you are all having incredibly busy weeks. I know we are uh, getting ready for some time with our families and to reflect on the year and, and to celebrate uh, Christmas together. So I appreciate you taking the time this week to be here with me. Uh, and you can find us here the first and third Wednesday of every month to talk about some wonderful history. So today I have a lot of notes, so we're going to get right into it. Uh, we are going to talk about a man named Christopher Ludwig. And as you may have seen in the title, he is the gingerbread man who helped build America. And so this was a story that I actually learned about from a children's book that I read with my daughter, Peyton. And we loved it. It is such a happy, happy story uh, for such a timeless treat. I should have had gingerbread here with me. That would have been... Man, that would have been great. You guys probably don't need to see me <laughs> eat of the 17 cookies that I plan on eating later today, so don't worry about it. Uh, but gingerbread goes back to being, before you know, we had large secular Christmas celebrations here in the US. And so this is a really neat story. And it's not just about gingerbread itself. It's about the man who, and all the things that he did as a even though he's a lesser known person in history, I think you'll agree with me after we read this together and go through his life that way more people need to know about him. <laughs> so um, Christopher Ludwig was born in Hesse, Darmstadt, Germany. Now, for those of you that speak German, my German is very rough. Uh, feel free to correct my pronunciation in the comments. Uh, I, I definitely take that well. Uh, he was born in 1720 to Heinrich and Catherine Ludwig. Now, Catherine died when, when he was very young. That was his mother. And his father was a baker. So for years until she died, or until after she died, rather, he went with his father to the bakery and learned how to be a baker in Germany. Now, when he turned 14, he began attending a school um, learning, uh, reading, writing, arithmetic. It was a free school for uh, the children that, that couldn't afford the larger schools. And he also received his catechism lessons in the Lutheran church. And that becomes important later in his life as well. He did have a sister, Helena, who married a, a stocking weaver and businessman in Amsterdam, and they did very well. So in his early years, he actually enlisted in the Austrian army. Now, and he did serve as a baker in the army. So it's something we don't really think about. I know that was kind of foreign to me to, to really consider is that you have you know, cooks in the army, but I didn't think about somebody being specifically a baker. But that was a really key staple is bread. And you have to have people in your military that can do that. So he was enlisted as a baker in the Austro-Russian Turkish War. Um, and there are actually several of those. I believe this was the fourth one uh, between 1737 and 1739. Um, for Ludwig, the harshest ramification of Austria's uh, defeat in that was that he and uh, several others had to make a trek in the middle of winter. It was over 350 miles from Turkey to Vienna. Very few people survived that. So he walked in a Balkan winter, 350 miles. And then um, after that, he was transferred over to Prague and endured a 17-week siege. So he was the recipient of that siege where he and 3,000 other Austrians were then taken prisoner. With that, he later joined the Prussian army and did very well there, uh, very well for himself. Uh, he received compensation for his services in 1742 when he was discharged. And he really didn't do so well while he was in this kind of in-between part of his life. Uh, he was forced to beg for bread and beer just to stay alive. And so this was a really low point in his life. And we see that come uh, into play later when he is very mindful of money and very mindful of being in debt and to, to be able to make his way on his own. At this point, he's, he's still a very 
young man. Uh, he became a sailor and joined the crew of the HMS Duke of Cumberland in early 1743. So he served for three different nations at this point in their military as a baker in every single one in that capacity. So he has truly already made that a career and he's made himself useful. So I think that's probably why he was successful in every single military. So he spent two years in the Royal British Navy and visited all over the world. Uh, he's going to the Indies, to China. And while he was in China, uh, he had a, a bowl made, a fine China bowl with a silver rim that had his name and the date put on it. It was the first really nice thing he was able to purchase for himself. Uh, his family hadn't been, uh, had been decently well off as a working class family, but this was his first thing as he's out in the world supporting himself, having gone through this, this period of destitution that he's able to afford something really nice for himself. And uh, later in life, he actually would, able, would uh, lift up this bowl. He pulled it out up until his death at parties and said health and long life to Christopher Ludwig and his wife. Christopher Ludwig, by all accounts, has a funny little habit of talking about himself in the third person, uh, which is endearing, honestly, in everything I read to him, or read rather about him. So uh, in 1745, he arrived in London and collected a fee of 111 guineas and an English crown. And that money he used to go home for the first time in eight years. When he arrived there, his father had passed. So the estate, uh, all of his father's belongings, any finances were all passed to him. So he sold the entire estate. He decided he didn't want to stay there. He wanted to move. He wanted to do things, right? He'd seen the world. And he sold it for 500 guilders, and, which was a, a pretty good sum. And he took his savings and went to London where the roughly 23, 24-year-old uh, lived a little lavishly for a while and depleted his stores. So he had to get another job. Um, and so he joined the English Merchant Service as a common seaman uh, between 1745 and 1753. So in mid-1754... He moved to Philadelphia with several gingerbread bread molds and baking instruments. And we have an image from the Diderot Encyclopedia that displays some of the instruments that he probably took with him to start a baking business because he knew that he was going to be an entrepreneur and start that. And that was his purpose of going to Philadelphia. So again, at this point, he is a widely traveled, uh, worldwide combat veteran of 34, and he is going to establish his business. Uh, now, Philadelphia offered him a huge market for, uh, for German goods. There was an inc ever-increasing German population in Pennsylvania. And so he's bringing this comfort of home. And it's, it's a brilliant market marketing tactic. So over the next 20 years, he didn't just bake. He invested in properties and truly, it's the American dream. He came over here with a dream and an adventure and made it happen. And so those properties uh, come into play in helping him amass what ends up being a, a substantial amount of wealth. Uh, but what he does with it is what makes him just a, a remarkable person. And we'll get there. Uh, here's the image from Diderot about what th the things that he might have had uh, in his shop. You see some different molds, trivets, some salamanders, which were used to take things in and out of ovens. Uh, and, and you have a bake shop there. So this would be the kind of thing you'd see in a, a confectioner that you would have here in Philadelphia. It's just a few of those things. So let's talk a little bit about gingerbread. I know my family loves gingerbread. My grandma has, we have a family secret recipe that we cannot give out. I promise grandma I won't tell anybody uh, but no we love gingerbread and we all get together and we decorate the cookies all together and so this is always intriguing to me about how it started as I'm sure it is to many of you so traditionally gingerbread had been produced in Europe for, for centuries it started as a medieval recipe um, and it reached during the crusades and it consisted of really simple ingredients flour honey um, some spices it wasn't it wasn't really complicated. Uh, by the 17th century, English recipes replaced honey with uh, treacle or molasses. 
which is most commonly what we have today is a, a molasses cookie here in the United States. And so they did it because it was cheap and it was available. You had English, uh, English colonies that were in the Indies and they were farming sugarcane um, and, and all that molasses is a byproduct of. So it became very cheap, which made it something that everybody could enjoy. Uh, so gingerbread could have been perform uh, made in a soft form and prepared that way. So it's actually truly a, a bread. It's kind of dense. And then you have Germany that adopts this gingerbread. And what they've done is they figured out that they could make a thinner, harder cookie. It would keep longer. And then they would form them into different molds. And we have some molds we'll show here in a little bit. Um, but they would form it into molds. And a lot of those times, molds were different, really ornate designs. They're not just stamping out gingerbread men like we have today. But they would be decorated for special occasions, for festivals and holidays. And they weren't just a Christmas cookie. So everybody from the rich and the, to the poor is getting to enjoy some form of gingerbread and, and nostalgia in that way. So commonly the finished products took the shape of, of royal figures, of other human images, actions, fables, tales. And then by the 18th century, you see this shift toward uh, showing the common person, which is interesting because we actually see that in Dutch art as well towards the end of um, the 17th and the beginning of the 18th century. And you start having depictions of uh, different trades and professions, ordinary domestic activities, proverbs, well-known political figures, and religious symbols. So we actually have a couple of molds here that belonged to uh, Ludwig that we'll pull up here. These were some of his gingerbread molds, and these are actually bequeathed uh, to the Museum of the American Revolution by his family. So they are there. These are in existence. These belong to him and very likely had a part in the story we're telling today, which just gives me the chills. But look at how ornate they are. And there are thousands of different carvings there that were used as gingerbread molds. Um, so those are just a really neat, neat piece to be able to see. And so while he's living there, Philadelphia sees this dramatic increase in the German population constantly. You have thousands of people, um, not just German, but European immigrants coming into the city uh, through the port there every day. And with that, you have this shop that's selling this little taste of home to no matter what social class you are, which is brilliant as a business strategy. So within a year, uh, Ludwig marries Catherine, and she is a young working class widow. Uh, they get married and they stay together for the rest of Catherine's life. It's very much a love story that she traveled with him frequently. And they really did use that money that they had together as a springboard for their business, which wasn't to say much. Catherine wasn't wealthy, she was okay. And so they took that and turned it into a, a very profitable business. And according to records, Ludwig, who again became really focused on never being in financial debt to anyone. He only borrowed money, according to him, once in his life, and that was he received two pence to buy a beer when he was impoverished in Berlin. And so after that, that's it, two pence. So uh, he and Catherine purchased a commercial building on Letitia Court in Philadelphia in 1755, and they operated that and lived out of there for for the next couple decades. Uh, Benjamin Rush, which is one of his very good friends, ended up writing the biography over him. He's a very popular name, very prolific writer. Uh, but he said he was much esteemed by all who did business with him for his integrity, punctuality, and for his disposition to do kind offices. And that's what makes him really unique is his disposition to do kind offices, which we're getting ready to get into. So bear with me. Uh, but within three years, Ludwig had perfected his industry and was making large, fancy confectionaries for really prominent people, including uh, William Fisher, who would become the Philadelphia mayor, and then a prominent businessman and merchant, Thomas Ritchie. So that, among many others, he's making large, large batches for these parties and getting more clients. So he's, he's pretty affluent at this time, uh, but he's still making 
the, the loaves and things to his roots and selling to everybody who walks into his store. By his gingerbread shop's 20th anniversary, Ludwig had purchased nine houses in Philadelphia, 30, a 32 acre farm in nearby Germantown and 123.5 acres in Lancaster County. That is a lot of property. So he's getting rents from all these other properties as well. 1775, Ludwig becomes a naturalized British subject. Timing on that's a little weird to want to become a naturalized British sub subject, but obviously people had a lot of opinions and things were really volatile, but he knew that he liked where he was. So he did that, which means he had to live in the colony for seven years. Uh, there are several necessary oaths you have to take and uh, you have to provide certification uh, that you've received the Holy Sacrament and you have to pay two shillings. If you had to guess which one of those was probably the most important to the British government at the time, I would say it was probably the last one, <laughs> followed by the first one. And even though he becomes a, uh, a British citizen, he actually never stops advocating for the German immigrants in Philadelphia. And he really valued education. So he actually helped organize something called the German Society of Pennsylvania. And that was officially founded December 26th, 1764. And he served as the vice president. So his anniversary is coming up. And Ludwig paid for his passage to the colonies, to Pennsylvania. Uh, a lot of people, German immigrants, did not speak English at the time. And they were signing indenture contracts that were written in English. And they, they didn't necessarily know the details of everything that they were signing up for because they couldn't read. Ludwig knew his education was a huge defining factor in, in his life and his success. And he wanted to make sure other people had that opportunity as well. And so uh, these contracts were often written, like I said, in English and compelled the passengers to work between four and five years to pay off their debt until their passage was paid in full. And so this is a really cool thing. According to the institution's foremost documents, the founders desired to instruct, quote unquote, the poor, the sick, and otherwise distressed Germans in the English and German languages, reading and writing thereof, and to produce for them such learning and education as would best suit them in their capacities and genius. They want to educate people to read and write because then nothing can take advantage of them and the world is open to them. And they want to teach them in German and in English. So... With that, he continued to promote education for the rest of his life, especially in children and indiscriminately, which is remarkable and huge for social reform in that era. He also supported the Lutheran Church in Pennsylvania. And again, he received a lot of education as a child from the Lutheran Church, and that was really formative for him. Uh, so he's active in St. Michael's Church in Germantown. Uh, I believe there is actually still a structure standing there, but it's not the original structure. I think the original burned down. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but I was looking at, at several different churches when researching this, and I know that that's true of, of one of them. And um, so with that, he actually was able to lend a large sum of money to the church as well as his donations. And then following the completion of... Uh, the Zion Church in Philadelphia on May 16, 1766. He became an advocate for that church as well, to the point where he actually met um, with Thomas Penn, who was the proprietor of the colony of Pennsylvania, and aided in the purchase of land for a cemetery for that church. So after two decades of both living and running the bakery on Letitia Court, the Ludwigs moved uh, to the corner of 4th and Race Streets, where they rented an exemplary house of the era, and and lived kind of in their prosperity and i believe they still owned the bakery at this point though they were not the ones necessarily operating it on a daily basis uh so this just a quick idea when i say an exemplary house at the time it had an 80 foot frontage on fourth street and a 68 foot frontage on race street so it was a nice sizable house in march the same year he actually joined the managerial board of the united company of philadelphia for promoting american manufacturers now that's a mouthful, but what they do, it was actually organized by his best friend, Benjamin Rush. And what they did was they were promoting uh, American workers for in wool, cotton, and linen manufacture and expanding that economy. And, and they were working with these different industries to help the poor find jobs, to be able to support themselves. They neither supported 
uh, aimless charity, I guess you could say. They supported giving people the means to support themselves. And you see that through everything they do. And on February 2nd, 1776, the Philadelphia Society for Assisting Distressed Prisoners was created. And Ludwig served as one of the 12 managers. What that did was focus on human rights issues, including those in prisons and the care of those uh, that are in the penal system and to get rid of archaic punishments. Um, I think, for example, public hangings and the use of a gibbet. He believed in reform and not necessarily uh, essentially a death penalty. So he worked through all of these organizations to improve the lives of the people around him. Again, indiscriminately, and a lot of his work was done for the less fortunate. Uh, politically, he was a moderate Whig, uh, so he was very, very middle of the road, but he did hold significant influence among the radical Whigs because many of them were German and working class. And so due to his influence, he joined the Philadelphia Committee of Correspondence in May 1774. And after only two months, Ludwig abandoned his moderate platform and was full on board to advocate for sovereignty from the British crown. And he, when he dedicates himself to something, he is all out. He is all in and he goes for it. So throughout um, the fall and winter of 1775, 1776, Ludwig actually was involved in a lot of different things, um, including the procurement of gunpowder. He was affluent enough to be able to make private purchases uh, of different things, including gunpowder, and actually transported uh, gunpowder from Philadelphia to Fort Ticonderoga for the, the United States. He also sat on a committee to approve the proposals of the First Continental Congress. So he's in the background of all these details in the formation of our country and its laws and this battle for independence, and nobody knows who he is. And I think that's incredible. And I think that's what we're here to do and to talk about together. So on June 18, 1776, um, by serving as a member of the Committee of the City of F in Philadelphia, um, he sat and spoke with noted individuals, including Ben Franklin, Thomas McKean, Benjamin Rush, and they established a pre preliminary framework that would become the Pennsylvania State Constitution. And uh, so he actually placed his business on hold and went to um, the city in the summer of 1776 to assist in the defense of New York under General George Washington himself. During the war, he gave money freely to the Patriot cause. So even though he, he's not acting as a baker in his shop and he put that on hold, he's still collecting rents and money that way. And so he is still profiting and he's still giving that money. On one occasion, it had been posed by Thomas Mifflin, who was a general, uh, to purchase firearms by private subscription. And that caused a lot of dissent and frustration. People didn't like that. Um, we're spending money, we're spending money. And he stood up and said that the poor gingerbread baker be put down for 200 pounds. He led by example. Was he poor? No, but uh, it was symbolic in a lot of ways. In the summer of 1776, he enlisted as a volunteer and served in persuading his, uh, his Hessian fellow countrymen to desert the British ranks. This is probably one of the coolest parts of his story. So the resolution passed in Congress on August 9, 1776, and it called for a committee to be established to encourage the desertion of King George III's foreign soldiers. Many of them were German speaking and, and from different German speaking regions of Europe. And so these committee members include Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin again, and because what doesn't he have his hand in? Uh, and, and the point was to give them incentives. They offered them land to desert and to stay. Uh, so after returning to the Continental Encampment, uh, Ludwig was actually given the authority over all German prisoners. And that was not for the entirety of the war, but for, for a, a significant amount of time. Um, he actually transported soldiers. He didn't want them to sit in prison. He said, you're not going to put somebody in prison and then be able to say, yes, we, but you should stay here with us. Here's some land. So here's a quote from him in a letter uh, that he sent to, to George Washington. He asked him to uh, allow him to take them to Philadelphia 
and there show them our fine German churches. Let them see how our tradesmen eat good beef, drink out of silver cups every day, and ride out in chairs every afternoon. Then let us send them back to their countrymen, and they will all soon run away and come settle in our city and be as good Whigs as any of us. And so he took them to Germantown. And here, here's an image of some Hessians uh, and different soldiers. But his work as the, the German emissary, American emissary to the Crown's foreign soldiers continued following uh, the victory at Trenton, New Jersey in late December of 1776. Within a week of that battle, the Hessians that were taken were marched through Philadelphia and relocated to Lancaster County, which is again, huge with a German population. They welcomed the prisoners, provided many of them homes and jobs, and they created a settlement. So they were taken and essentially said, you have, you're gonna be American citizens now. Here come among people that are like you and, and welcome in a lot of ways in this area. And that's very different than being stuck in as a POW. And so I think that that's really neat that he focused so much on helping people like him. He was a soldier. He was a soldier four times over. He was a prisoner of war. And he said, we can do this better. And then did it. And that's inspired. Uh, so to move on, on May 3rd, uh, May 3rd, 1777, Congress appointed Ludwig superintendent of bakers and director of baking in the Grand Army of the United States. So once again... Ludwig is now serving as a baker in another army, but this time he's in charge. And so after being appointed, he traveled to Morristown, New Jersey, where he oversaw the construction of several bake ovens. Uh, we do have these, which is, are images from Valley Forge of the recreated bake oven, ovens there. Those would have all been directed uh, by uh, Ludwig. And so uh, that's just one of several, and they were at multiple different sites. And after two months at Morristown, managing the erection of these ovens, many of which he paid for with his own money, uh, he returned to Philadelphia and recruited bakers from, from the general populace and people he knew. He knew. Uh, rather than give a daily allotment of flour to each soldier, all flour was to be sent to Ludwig and his bakers. That was a problem very early on in the war where people are, are pooling their fellow hour together and giving it to one person to, to bake. And then that person is selling off flour rations to other people and, and making a profit off them. So this meant people were actually getting fed. That the soldiers didn't have to worry about finding somebody to bake bread for them. And so it was actually stipulated to him that he should return one pound of bread for every pound of flour delivered to him. But he at once replied, no gentlemen, I will not accept of your commission upon any such terms. Christopher Ludwig does not want to get rich by the war. He has money enough. I will furnish 135 pounds of bread for every 100 weight of flour you put into my hands. He is repeatedly reported to be incredibly honest. He's saying, I don't need to profit from the war. I'm here to support the cause and I'm here to do a job. And that is incredibly rare. So Ludwig immediately complained that there's no system to deliver the bread to the men. We have this, we can't get it to them, they're hungry. And so shortly after the conclusion of winter, corner, winter quarters at Valley Forge, you have this reorganization of the quartermaster office so that that becomes, the quartermaster office becomes in charge of delivering and sending out this bread to the people who need it. Uh, he personally funded a lot of the, the bake ovens and such, but they provided him with $1,000, which is approximately $16,800 in, in 2011, was kind of the best conversion I could find, uh, to be used for oven construction, as well as granting the authority to obtain flour from any commissary office. So no matter where he was, he personally had the authority and his bakers did to uh, retrieve the flour they needed to bake the bread for the, for the troops. Uh, in addition, he also completed private baking orders uh, for, for Washington himself, uh, for many others in, in the officer corps. Uh, and so he, he was able to make a little bit of money that way, but a lot of it was still being put back into the cause and in the bake ovens and the 
paying his assistant bakers. He was often invited to dine at Washington's large dinner parties. So he's now, he's now moving up in the ranks here. And the commander in chief is reported to have usually addressed him as my honest friend. Ludwig wrote to Congress January 27th, 1781, and he actually attempted to resign his position. Uh, he cited that you know, he's now been four very difficult physical years. Um, he's not as young as he once was, and he's ready to retire. He, you have my support, but I need out, uh, including the loss of his right eye. So he gave his eye, he gave his money, he's, he's, he's done. Congress actually refused to accept his resignation. They said, nope, we actually still need you. Sorry, thanks, but no thanks. Um, and they attempted to rectify his frustrations that he was having by providing him with additional money and additional authority to hire bakers. And here's a little newspaper clipping of, of an ad for bakers. And so you see 12 foremen, three subdirectors, and 60 bakers. That's a lot of hands that he was short. And then after the war here, so he, he they're successful and there's a tale of him uh, to, upon celebration of the war on Cornwallis's, um, uh, upon his surrender that they made 6,000 loaves uh, of gingerbread to celebrate the, the victory for the troops. That is a little bit of a legend. I've not been able to completely confirm that. So if you find a link that does, please let me know. Uh, that's one thing I would definitely look into more, but it, it just seems, it makes me happy. So I, I enjoy, this is just a, a good person doing good things. And I think we need that this season. So after the war, upon completing his military service uh, at West Point, he returns to his Germantown farm. Unfortunately, he and his wife find that his estate has been completely ransacked and raided. He has nothing. They don't have dishes. They don't have clothes. Only what they had had with them traveling. So they have spent most of their money on the war and he decides instead of, instead of buying on debt, instead of trying to purchase to get us back where we were, what we're going to do is we're going to cash in these bonds that I have. And so he cashes in bonds that he'd invested before the war. Unfortunately, he's receiving highly depreciated money at this point. Um, and then rather than continuing and trying to restart his baking business again, the war has been very physically hard on him. He, sell, he sells some of his remaining properties and, and purchases furniture and clothing and invested the remainder in stocks. And so he's taking what little money he can, investing it to try and turn it around a little bit more. Um, they do sell the house. And here we actually have an ad for the sale of his house. So this is really cool. We'll leave this up for just a second. You're welcome to skim through it. Um, but this is selling his, his bakery and his house and charging a, a fairly meager rent. Uh, in March 1785, he wrote an appeal to Congress in which he acknowledged the vast sum of money that he had personally invested. Uh, and then his contribution in purchasing supplies, flour, weapons, powder, all of that. Um, and he is asking for a a small compensation. This is to help him get back on his feet and to purchase his necessary items. Again, they're not super wealthy, but he's saying, I've done this investment. I need a little bit of help now. He actually received affidavits from Arthur St. Clair, William Irving, Anthony Wayne, Timothy Pickering, and Thomas Mifflin. He also requested a letter from George Washington. And the general wrote a letter dated March 29th, 1785. And it was so moving to him that he actually kept the letter, had it framed and was on his parlor wall in the complimentary things that were said about him. For his efforts, he received $200 from Congress on June 13th, 1785, which is approximately $4,770. Again, that's a 2011 conversion. So it may be a little different now, um, but that was the best and most solid one I could find. So it's, it's enough to, to settle him up again. So for a decade, Ludwig and Catherine uh, remain in Germantown and they live happily together. They live off their returns from his stocks, off the rents that they're already charging. And then unfortunately in 1796, on September 21st, Catherine dies. And with that, 
he always ref- Benjamin Rush actually referred to her as the faithful companion of his labors because she had been by his side through it all. He sold everything, sold all but one of his remaining properties and actually moved in and boarded with uh, Frederick Fraley, who was actually his former apprentice and was a baker. While he was living with him, um, all of his proceeds he collected from these transactions were converted into stocks. He put them into stocks and bonds to save. While he's residing with him, the yellow fever breaks out in Philadelphia and Ludwig feels called to service again. He's financially in a point where he's doing okay. And so what he does is he actually bakes thousands and thousands of loaves of bread and gives them to the hungry people who are starving during this epidemic in the summer of 19 or 1797. He is somebody who's giving what he can. And that is his gift in, in baking and his knowledge. Uh, the following year, Ludwig did remarry uh, Sophia Binder. After that, he, he retires. He, they go and they live together and they read the Bible and visit people they know and have dinner and relax. He's, he's finally got a, to a point where he just is. Uh, he was incredibly hurt at the death of his friend, General Washington. And told Sophia that shortly after he would pass as well. He did get sick. Um, in the final two years of his life, he suffered from a chronic pneumonia and, and did eventually pass and was interred on June 19th, 1801 in St. Michael's Lutheran Church in Germantown, following a sermon presided over by Reverend Schaefer. And here we have, and from Benjamin Rush's biography that he wrote, uh, a small small page here uh, in memory of Christopher and Catherine. And um, you should definitely take time to, to pause and read that. It is very complimentary. And it really speaks to who he is because right now, we're getting, as we get to the end, I want to tell you about his legacy. And he's truly somebody who leaves a legacy of giving. So upon his death, he actually um, included bequests to local institutions. And I'm going to have to read these because there are, are several. Uh, Ludwig had already accrued wealth from many investments. He's, again, lived at a, a very leisurely but not super expensive life at the end of his life. And when his estate is liqui- liquidated, he made, comp- he made um, contributions to these organizations, Guardians of the Poor, the Pennsylvania Hospital, Reformed Church in Philadelphia, St. Michael's Lutheran Church in Germantown, the German Society of Pennsylvania, the University of Pennsylvania. And they all received set contributions, but this is the big one. Ludwig's remaining assets were bestowed to a fund, and this is in his, a quote from his will, for the schooling and educating gratis of poor children of all denominations in the city and liberties of Philadelphia without any exception to the country, extraction, or religious principles of their parents or friends. No matter who you are, if you can't afford an education, here's where you can have one. And he actually required and stipulated that the school be established in five years of, or the remainder of his estate be divided uh, between several churches. So he put an incentive in there saying, this money's not gonna sit around for you to do whatever you want with, Use it to do what I said, or you don't get it. And uh, the Philadelphia Society for the Establishment and Support of Charity Schools managed the fund. And they actually had to wait five years to build it because of the liquidation of all of his assets. And so while Catherine was alive, um, between his public stocks, bonds, and mortgages, that amounted to $10,340, which translates to approximately uh, $179,000. Upon Sophia's death, the society also obtained that house that she was living in, and that was sold for another $13,000 to his estate. So another $225,000 $225,000 to be put towards the school. 
Uh, Benjamin Rush, who was Ludwig's closest friend, joined the society and aided in the development of these schools that he was funding. So in 1803, prior to their possession of his estate, Rush publicly requested donations and purchasing the ground in the schoolhouse. By the end of 1804, a two-story brick building had been completed and it had classes for over 275 male students by 1809. Two years later, in 1811, a school was added to educate female students. In 1814, more proceeds were collected to fund a library. Uh, here's the front piece of the biography that Benjamin Rush wrote. It is short, uh, but it is very interesting. It is easily found online. Um, but he wrote this biography of his remarkable friend. In 1872, the society was renamed the Ludwig Institute, and again in 1995 to its current status as the Christopher Ludwig Foundation. So this baker, this gingerbread maker from, from Germany who served in now five armies, made bread for the troops, fed people who needed it, helped people who were sick, worked his worked so hard to help make his world a better place and in the end his legacy still lives on today in this foundation that is still educating children in those social reforms and his belief that it didn't matter who you were or how you got here that you know it's i think that's remarkable and i think that that is this true spirit of giving and that's why i thought it would be wonderful not just gingerbread uh, but but that spirit to show today. Um, I believe we do have a copy of the letter from George Washington. Um, let's see if let's see if behind the scenes they're working some magic to get that pulled up for you. There it is. So uh, we can put a link to that as well, so you can read it. Sometimes it takes a little time. Uh, Cynthia, I do not have any recipes here uh, with me. Uh, I will find some good recipes though. I really wanna try a, a period gingerbread. I've not strayed from my own grandma's recipe. Uh, the link to the letter is, is gonna be posted so you guys can read it. The here is, here's an 18th century recipe, um, again, that we have for you. It's not one that I have tried, so if you try it, I do accept um, samples. I will be your official taste tester if you need. Um, but uh, yeah, we'd love to see photos if you do use an 18th century recipe. So thank you all so much for, for joining me during this. And I hope that this gives you kind of that spirit of giving, of holiday, of uh, bettering your world to, you know, with your fellow man and I wish you a very, very Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and we will see you again in the new year.